Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming this early hour. Uh, it's, I think it's late for me, but that's okay, early for you. And <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, so this is uh, lecture two. Uh, we'll see how this goes today. I hope things well. First of all, I want to um, uh, give you, we had discussion about the cost of ink last time. And so I, I oops, sorry. I went back and got, where's the pointer? There we go. Went back and got an uh, article from the Los Angeles Times in August of 2004 which had HP touting its ink sector. I didn't even know HP had an ink sector at the time. And there was an ink race as well. You can see these are the increase of sales of ink in billions of dollars in the US in 2004. <coughs> and um, it says right here that, they, that the printing division in Hewlett Packard spent a billion dollars a year on research on printers and ink. And then down here it says, the little thing I blew up there, that, that 74% of the opera, the profits of the company came from the printer division. And I thought they made electronics. <laughs> so. <coughs> so there's money in ink, apparently. That picture shows what is more expensive than printer? Yes, that shows you printer ink is more expensive than Sino number five. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? You know Say again? <laughs> I s somehow I don't think that's going to be uh, well received, but uh, anyway, okay. So, <coughs> and I, I had this yesterday. I wanted to sort of uh, delve in a little bit into in terms of complex or fluids or soft matter, and I mentioned why they're uh, soft in terms of the fact that the, there are many fewer particles uh, per unit volume than a molecular system. And they're also slowed down, and that makes it easy to dry them out of equilibrium. And I want to try to uh, describe to you the, uh, how one thinks about modeling these types of systems and uh, how the high dynamics uh, play a role in what goes on. So that's where we're going to start. <coughs> um, today I'm going to try to, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try to drive equations. So it's going to be a, a pedagogical lecture, so you're welcome to take notes. And rather than having the board, I have them on the slides, so they look pretty and nice. And so the first thing we're going to have to think about is we want to treat the, we're going <coughs> to see if we can't treat the solvent as a continuum. And so I'm going to then uh, make one assumption, and from that one assumption we can derive everything else we need to know. And that assumption is simply the fact that the particle we're going to be interested in, the quota particles, here's a nice example of quota particles, are much larger than the solvent molecule. So these are silica microspheres, they're about a micron or so in diameter, and it turns out you can make um, really perfect monodispersed spherical particles and actually make um, particles behave like hard spheres, and the quota version is actually better than the atomic version, which is argon. Okay, they're actually better hard spheres than argon in terms of those things, because you can adjust things properly and so on. But so, so the idea for a continuum approximation is this is supposed to be a particle, and these little dots are supposed to be like solvent molecules, and solvent molecules are of size A sub solvent, and particle of size A sub P. And if you ask yourself, um, just how many solvent molecules do I find for each colloidal particle? And that number goes like the size ratio cubed. That's just to fill space. So there are lots of little solvent molecules around for every uh, large particle that you have. The other thing we need to know about is the time scale. And so does anybody, anybody know, this is a pedagogical lecture, so there are questions. <coughs> anybody know what the characteristic time scale for a solvent molecule is? Those, uh, you're all thinking, oh my gosh, that was kinetic theory in undergraduate physics. I've forgotten these things. So anybody have an idea? How would you estimate what the time scale is? <laughs> Say again? Do solvent molecules diffuse in the molecular scale individually? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, you're, you're even more courageous than Einstein. Einstein is a sugar molecule that's big in water. But individual water molecule? So how long does it take a molecule to move its size? Uh, root mean square velocity. It's always true. Gas, liquid, solid doesn't really matter, right? So. <coughs> that time scale then is the particle size divided by the root mean square of kT over the mass. And for uh, angstrom size like water molecule is about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Okay? So all the numbers I give you are, rel are relevant to uh, water. It turns out you can get that same estimate a different way. And that estimate you can get from the particle solvent molecule squared divided by the kinematic viscosity of the fluid treated as a continuum. Kinematic viscosity, the, uh, den the viscosity divided by the density which is a continuum concept, but yet it still works even to that scale. It re represents the fact that if a solvent molecule moves, it's got to displace other solvent molecules around it, and that becomes then the momentum transferred to the solvent, and so you get the same estimate for the time scale associated with that motion, and it scales uh, that way. The reason I do that is that if you now think about, and we'll see, I'll, I'll drive this for you in a moment, 
the time scale for the colloidal particle um, is um, the same ratio. I can also get the same for the colloidal particle. And as a result, the time scale for the colloidal particle compared to the solvent scale is like the size ratio squared. It does. Yeah. Okay. So, so. one uh, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, please. The, the KT, that estimate is mostly the ballistic motion of the solvent. Is it, uh, the first estimate is the, the solvent's in thermodynamic equilibrium. So, the kinetic energy is 1 FKT per degree of freedom. It has to be true. Didn't, I don't have to tell you whether it's ballistic or not. You can relate it to the diffusivity as well, so of course, right? In some sense, the first and second steps are uh, another way of saying fluctuation is uh, no, we'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> well, that's just the solvent. I haven't even put the particle in there yet. This is, this is what the solvent is doing. Okay, we'll get to the fluctuation dissipation in a moment. But it just tells me that from this observation, I can then get an estimate of the time scale change associated with the quota particle compared to the solvent. I'll derive that for you in just a moment. But this relates to tell you that I can then think that there are lots of solvent particles running around, and they're running around much faster than the larger quota particle can respond. And I'll derive that for you in a moment. And that means we can make the solvent a continuum. So we're going to now more or less eliminate all the solvent molecules and just replace it with a continuum with the usual Navier-Stokes equations with a constant viscosity and incompressible fluid. Okay? So that's the basic assumption that allows us to do that, just the size ratio. Mm -hmm. So the reason the two numbers work out is because the molecular viscosity and viscosity is driven by the Yeah. Or you can also think it uh, more mechanically in some sense that this is the ballistic. This is the ballistic motion, the th random fluctuation motion of the solvent molecule. It, it moves someplace, and doing so, it has to kick the other molecules out of the way, and that is how momentum is transferred into the fluid. And so, it makes sense that they should somehow be connected to each other. Okay. Yes. Here, in this, these are, are one micron. One micron. Right. And we'll come back to the, the favorite number to keep, keep in your mind is a half a micron. We'll see that how it comes out nicely in a moment. Okay. <coughs> So that we can make it a continu continuum, and then we're going to make it at small Reynolds numbers, uh, that the motion typically, the velocity, the particle size are small, the viscosity large, and so the Reynolds number for the motion is small, and that gives rise to the uh, Stokes equations. Okay? So that's the first thing we need to <coughs> make sure that, even though we're going to things, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to worry about particles which are 10 nanometers in size in a one angstrom solvent, which is like water, there's still a total of magnitude separation of size scale, and there's still lots of con continuum particles and much slower time scales for the quota particle. So that's why we can actually go down to such small scales and still treat the thing as a continuum. Okay? Okay. So that means then our particle now, so now the solvent's gone, you can't see it anymore. <coughs> it has this equation, mass and acceleration, some of the forces. And these are the forces which are just coming from the fluid. Okay? So there's going to be a force due to the dynamic drag force, I'm going to call F super H. And then I'm going to talk about Brownian forces in a moment, so I'm just going to put them here, F Brownian. And you get the force, the uh, hydrodynamic force is the integral of the continuum stress over the surface, as you normally do. And now we have no inertia, so we have the Stokes equations for the fluid velocity field. Okay? With a no sub-boundary condition. So if this particle moves with a velocity capital U, it, it's, a, it's a rigid particle, every point in the surface moves the same way. Then because the Stokes equations are linear, there's a linear relationship between the force and the translational velocity. That just has to be because it's linear. And this symbol here, R, is called a hydrodynamic resistance tensor, which couples the force to the velocity. And it's a function of the geometry only, just the geometry of the body. For a sphere, since it's, it's isotropic, it's just minus 6 pi eta AU. That's the Stokes drag formula. But the important thing to keep in mind is this linear relationship. It just has to be true because you're in Stokes flow. Double the velocity, you double the force. Change the sign, change the sign. Okay? <coughs> and from that, and now from the for a sphere, if I then uh, write down the equation for put the drag in for a sphere, now you see there's a natural time constant which emerges just from the mass divided by the drag. It's a damped equation. Okay? And so the natural time constant appears, which is the time scale for the particle momentum to relax, which is the mass divided by the drag coefficient. And that then, I just worked that out for you for a spherical particle, it's the particle size squared divided by the kinetic viscosity, multiplied by the density of the sphere compared to the density of the fluid. Okay? <coughs> and so that gives me where I got that size ratio squared from before. Okay? So they move much more. So particle then, even just 10 times larger than the solvent molecule, has got 10 to the 6 solvent molecules around it, and it's got 10 to the 4th slower time scale. 
So even the factor of 10, we already have a huge separation of scales between the molecules of the solvent and the quota particle. Yes? So we are inhibiting inertia for the solvent. Say again? We are inhibiting inertia for the solvent. Correct. But we are still controlling the inertia for the single particle motion. We are. Um, yes and no. So it's not inconsistent because I'm going to have to worry about that. We'll see. We'll get rid of it in a moment. <laughs> I have fluctuating forces from here, which I have to worry about the inertia. We'll come to that of the particle in a moment. Um, but um, as a different element, which is something I wanted to say also, um, that we can think of the particle inertia uh, defined in a Stokes number, which would be a uh, Reynolds number based upon the particle density. And so that is the proportion of the Reynolds number based upon the fluid density, okay? <coughs> and so if the particles and the fluid are the same density, then the inertia is both the Stokes number, that is measuring the uh, inertia of the particle is the same as the inertia of the fluid, and that's typically the case for these situations. Um, and more generally, where it's not the case is uh, uh, heavy particles in a gas, so small, even small particles in a fluidized bed, it's a chemical engineer, they have small Reynolds numbers but high Stokes numbers because their density is a thousand times that of air. And actually, um, I don't know if I get to it or not, you can think about, you can connect to granular flows are ones in which have lots of particle inertia but no fluid, no fluid inertia as well, okay? <coughs> Particle, yes, right. There's a, there's a, there are, uh, uh, 100 micron catal fluid, uh, fluidized catalytic convert, uh, catalytic catalyst particle, 100 microns to show in size, has a Stokes number of 1 and a Reynolds number of 10 to minus 2. So it has inertia for the particle, but not inertia for the fluid. So is that the ratio of the dissipation of the drag on the particle of what? Due to, Due to its velocity, its size, and whatever, right? And compared to the, uh, the fluid, which is the fluid density there. So there is, a, there is a limit where it's appropriate to have inertia of a particle and have no inertia of the fluid. That does exist. It's uh, harder the other way around to have lots of inertia of the fluid but no inertia of the particle, right? That's because, well, you can make a bubble which has got no density, but then there's the added mass, and so you don't get away without having inertia, in that, even in that case, okay? Bubbly liquids could be close to that. Okay, back to our colloids. Uh, so we have that, and then, um, so that was gives me the hydrodynamic drag force, and then I want to think about the uh, fact that the, there are still solid molecules when still there, there they are, the back again. And these are fluctuating and they collide periodically, uh, typically with the colloidal particle. And I want to figure out what impact of all those solvent collisions with the colloidal particle has on the particle's uh, motion. And uh, that then <coughs> is this Brownian force. And it's got, a, and I'll define what I mean by the average in a moment. An average at zero. And I'm going to say there's a correlation at two different times that's instantaneous in time. That's the definition of your Brownian motion. That's because the time scale associated with those forces are the solvent time, which is much faster than the response time of this particle, the quarter particle. <coughs> and what I mean by that average, so let's imagine for a moment <coughs> we think about <coughs> what happens when a particle, a solvent molecule collides. It, uh, uh, during its time of its collision, it has an impulse, it kicks this particle. It get, hits a force on it, and I then figure out for each individual particle that collided how much force it contributes to this in that time interval of its terrace, and I add up all those particles that collided with it. That's what I mean by the average, okay? And on average, there's number no more to the right than to the left, so there's no average force. Um, but then I have to figure out how many particles are going to collide with this quota particle in a characteristic time scale of the solvent motion, right? Okay? And that number is going to be given by the area of this particle times the size of the solvent, because the solvent molecule must be within it order its size in order to collide with the particle in its solvent's time scale. So that gives me the, the number, the area times the number solvent size times the number density of solvent molecules. Okay? <coughs> yes? It's, it, I don't know exactly what happens. I add up what it does over the time scale for that interaction, whatever it happened to be. It turns out it doesn't matter, okay? I don't know detail. It depends upon the molecular structure and detail and so on and so forth, but all I need to know is that over the time scale of the solvent, it'll have interacted and have forced it in some fashion. I add up all those forces, and that's the statistical average I want to take 
for defining what the mean value of the force is and the fluctuations. And the fluctuations then are given by some amplitude, which we're going to have to figure out what that amplitude is. Okay? So that's um, what we have for that, right? I think that's it. Right, and so <coughs> then the number of collisions which occur in the time for the quota part to relax is like the size ratio to the fourth power, because there are lots of them. So again, uh, so even a factor of 10, or let's say a 10 nanometer particle in angstrom fluid, you got 10 to the eighth collisions from the solvent in the time that I could change my momentum. It's a lot. So on average, it's zero. And those occurred instantaneously because the time scale here is really the solvent time scale, not the momentum time scale. Okay? So that's the basic underlying idea behind the impacts from the solvent. <coughs> and that then um, tells you what you need. That, that's what defines, if you will, um, the fact that there's zero average and then the fluctuations are instantaneous in time, a delta function correlated in time. Okay? That's what we mean by that. Instantaneous on the, on the time scale of tau p. We're worried about this guy's motion. Okay? And there are lots of them. He hasn't had a chance to move yet. So as far as the, this particle is concerned, those collisions look instantaneous. Okay? All right. So therefore, now I'm gonna now I put my, my drag in and we can this is a first order OD, we can integrate it. That was easy to do. Okay, that's the integration of that equation. Okay. The velocity at any instant time is where I started, whatever it happened to be, and it decays away. And then what I'm forced with with this, so if you take the average value, its average force is zero, nothing happens. So the average is not interesting, but what's important is the square of the average velocity. So I just squared this formula and then did the put my correlation in, did the integration. You get two contributions. One is uh, how what I started off, of course, and that decays away exponentially in time on the time scale of the momentum relaxation of the quota particle, plus the correlation of the fluctuating forces with their amplitude, which I don't know yet, and that works out. Okay? <coughs> There's one other thing that happened. If you square something, then there was a correlation between the velocity, initial velocity of the particle, and the random thermal forces. Okay? So that correlation is also assumed to be zero. It's definition of Brownian motion that no matter how I was moving, there's no correlation. That's a statement that the solvent's not driven out of equilibrium by the motion of this larger particle. Okay? That's just the dyadic product. This is a this is a this is a tensor, yeah. It's a dyad. Sorry, I didn't. I I ran out of. I could have done indices, but my I don't know how to do. Anyway, yeah, it's a dyad, right? <coughs> okay, so that's it. Then here comes the following. Here comes the following important physical assumption. The definition, if you will, of Brownian motion, is um, the fact that at times long compared to the momentum relaxation of this particle now, so the initial velocity decays away as this correlation does, this quota particle is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the solvent. So its kinetic energy must also be one half kBT. Okay? That then gives us what the amplitude of the correlation is. It just tells us that this correlation is two kBT times the drag, or back to thing 2 kBT times the resistance tensor. And that's known as the fluctuation dissipation theorem. That the fluctuating random forces that impart kinetic energy to the quota particle, that kinetic energy is redissipated into the solvent by viscous drag. Okay? That's where it comes from. On a time scale much larger than particle time scale. Correct. Okay? <coughs> but it's exponential, so you need you know two or five or ten, doesn't matter, you're done. Okay? We'll come back, you'll see another important, there's a very important aspect that I want to show next, another aspect which will make it even inter more interesting, more clear, whatever we want to think about it. Okay, so that's the basic fluctuation dissipation. There are lots of versions of this thing, they all have the same character, um, <coughs> but that's it. Okay. 
So, I, so you think of it this way. It's, let's imagine you put the particle in there uh, cold. So I zero velocity. I don't, don't let it go. Okay. Then I let him go. So I put him there. I put him down there. Optical tweezers hold him fixed. Then let him go. He's then going to eventually achieve the thermal. He's going to have. He's going to have a thermal velocity as well. And he's going to achieve the kinetic energy of the solvent. So he's going to receive from the solvent the fluctuations and start to jiggle around. And then also have a thermal velocity and a kinetic energy. And, and so that impartion of that fluctuating thermal motion to the particle is dissipated back in the drag of the solvent because the whole system is in equilibrium together. Okay? And that's the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And that's what tells us what this amplitude is. And this is the specification of Brownian motion. Well, they'll come to that in a second. I can drive the random walk in a moment. Okay. <coughs> so that's the basic physics that goes on. That's known as the Langevin equation from Langevin. Um, and uh, so, <coughs> so we ca there we go. And now I'm going to do one more thing. I want to know, um, that's the momentum balance. I want to know uh, where do they go. I want to know where they move their position, change the position as a function of uh, the velocity. So I calculated for you. It's not hard. I integrated again. It's really hard. You know. So my last night I was working hard doing all my integrals. Um, you can, you're supposed to smile at least, okay? So, so the mean position is where I started, plus it just, you know, it goes away. And so what's interesting to ask yourself is how far does this particle move in the time scale for its, when its momentum relaxed? So you give it a kick and ask how far does it go? And so the relevant question is, what's the displacement compared to my size? How far did I go? And here's my thing, of an, an average. I go just my initial velocity times the my momentum relaxation time divided by particle size. The momentum relaxation time, I forgot to write down again. Let's write that down so we don't forget that. It's useful to have. <coughs> so mass divided by 6 pi eta a sub p. And so um, that's just the Reynolds number. So the distance the particle traveled compared to its size is its Reynolds number, which is tiny. Put in here the oh, what characteristic velocity do I have? The only characteristic velocity is the thermal velocity of the particle. And this is for a, even for a 10, 10 nanometer sized particle, that's less than an angstrom. So the particle hasn't gone anywhere in its own momentum relaxation time. It hasn't moved at all. So I haven't driven the solvent on equilibrium. I haven't gone anywhere, even though my momentum's relaxed back away. <coughs> okay? And that means that the mass of the particle doesn't matter. Okay? Back at the back of the room. So that doesn't matter. You got rid of the mass. I don't worry at all. The mass doesn't matter. I just have what's either what I call the displacement equation or the overdamped Langevin equation. It's just no acceleration, balance of forces. Okay? That's where it all comes from. I don't know what U0 is. The only value I know would be the thermal velocity. You put that in there and, and, and then put a number in there for a, a, a 10 nanometer sized particle and an angstrom solvent and it's gone in less than an angstrom. It's gone. Uh, I guess, uh, I'm thinking if you have a <coughs> particle being swept up by a flow. Fine, but even then, uh, that velocity is much smaller than an actual thermal velocity anyway, right? If I'm Driving the flow, okay, it's hard to get an actual velocity that's greater than the thermal velocity of a particle, right? I'm trying to reconcile the fact that you've got the left-hand side with the high Stokes number. Well, okay, so where the, where the Stokes number is relevant are only when the particle density is much larger than the suspending fluid, so a particle in a gas would be appropriate. Now, for a gas, <coughs> You have to change all this to make the mean free path the relevant microscopic length scale, not the particle size. And that changes things quite a lot, right? Because the mean free path is much larger than the size of the molecule. And that's the relevant length scale on a gas. And you've got to go through the thing again for that. You still get brand new motion, still these kind of effects going on. But you have other lengths, other time scales to worry about now. So I would change every get it back and start and so on and so forth, right? Because that, that solvent, the mean free path now can be much larger than the solvent size, and that changes the time scale ratio now has got to be AP over lambda, the free mean free path, and that may not be, for a micron sized particle in a gas, may not be uh, separation of scales any longer. Okay?
So I, I'm not going to apply this to a gas. So my density can be equal to 1, and we're good. Okay? <coughs> but those are all where, where things we're worried about, because there are, there are important problems where you have particles in a gas that the gas molecule is called fluctuations. They undergo brown motion as well, and you have to think about those things and, and what limits are you appropriate or what limits do I need to worry about the graininess of the gas. But those would all come in to where the continuum approximation for the gas breaks down. So you have to go back to again. <coughs> okay, as long as you can treat the fluid as a continuum, you're good to go. Okay? So it's just one assumption that large compared to the solvent side. Everything else follows from that. You don't need any additional conditions on the behavior. There's another very important aspect um, associated with this, and that is that from a statistical mechanical aspect, in statistical mechanics, you need both positions and momenta. Now we don't need any positions. There's no momentum. It's just configuration is important. Okay? From a stat mac point of view, you've projected down that momentum is slaved to the configurations. Okay. okay. So what comes next? What comes next? Oh yes. Right. Uh, diffusion. Yeah, Brownian motion. How do you get diffusivity out of all this? Okay. So now we have our got rid of the rid of the acceleration. We got our drag laws and so on. So we're good to go. Now I calculated the mean squared position as a function of time. <coughs> and I then make use of the known now correlation of those forces. And you end up with the mean squared displacement is twice kBT over the drag, grows linearly in time. It's isotropic. And that then defines the Stokes, Einstein, Sutherland diffusivity. Translation of diffusivity is kBT divided by the drag, or it's kBT times the inverse of the resistance or what's often called KBGM is the mobility coupling velocity to force. Okay? That's where it all comes from. Okay? That's what Stokes Einstein Sutherland diffusivity is. And that's for times long compared to tau p. But the particle still hasn't moved at all. It's what's known as the short time self diffusion coefficient. Because the particle hasn't actually gone anywhere yet. But it's got so many little kicks, jiggled around like this, and now I'm doing a random walk, but it really hasn't gone anyplace yet. It hasn't actually moved comparable to its size at all. It's moved a tiny fraction of its size, but yet it becomes diffusive. Okay? And undergoes a, a random walk associated with that. What says next? Ha! Huh. <coughs> now a new time emerges now. Now there's a different time which is important, and that time is the time it takes a particle to diffuse of order its size. That now is really the relevant appropriate time scale to think about the dynamics of the colloidal particles. The solvent moment of oxygen doesn't matter. Their momentum actually doesn't matter. What matters is how they diffuse around to change their configuration in sample space. And that's given by the size squared divided by the diffusivity, which, since this is diffusivity, it goes like the size cubed now. So we get an extra factor of size ratio separation of scales in time scale between the solvent and the relevant characteristic time for the particle configuration to change. And that's what I wrote down when I said the first slide that remembers. Oh, yes, so here we go. All right, here we go. So here's all the time scales. <coughs> okay? Solvents much less than the particle relaxation, much less than diffusion. Then we have flow time scales depending upon what's going on. And so I have them all summarized here for you. Here is our solvent time scale. Here's our particle of solvent molecules. That scales in this fashion. Um, momentum relaxation time, this is the drag over this. I've written down numbers for our favorite number of a half a micron size particle. Uh, so that's roughly 10 to the minus 8 seconds is the time scale for its momentum re to relax. Five orders of magnitude faster than the solvent, okay? And it hasn't gone anywhere. And that's a tiny time. You have to, if you want to see the particle momentum relax, you've got to look at it at times 10 to the minus 8 seconds for a half micron size particle in water. Otherwise, you can't see it. Okay? You don't see that. You just see the random steps associated with the brownian motion. And then we have the time scale for diffusion. And for half micron size particle, that's a second. Okay? That's the time scale that we think and worry about. That's a time scale that's important. 
that's a time scale we need to compare against if we have a flow, some shear rate, for example, or with particle sediment. Those are the times we want to compare against. It's the diffusion time. These times are all too short, and we can't see what goes on. And then that gives us an additional separation of time scales, additional factor of size ratio. We've got lots of solvent, and they're really fast compared to the motion of the particle. So there's a huge separation of length and time scales. Solvent's a continuum, and we don't worry about the momentum relaxation of the particles or the fluid at all. That's the mechanics of colloids. Got to look down here. You can't. I mean, you can. People do. People, people are very careful, and they make good measurements, and, and so on. And if you shrink the particle down, you know, you can try to see these things, but you have to take great care to do that. And so, they're not relevant for most of the dynamics and most of the process one thinks about for motion of colloids and so on. All the soft, squishy things that we do, all the models of polymer rheology and so on, they're all under the same assumptions. They're all in this. All soft matter is this. Okay, there's nothing, they all start from this perspective. Okay, and you have to go, it doesn't mean that's correct, but that's where we all start. Um, you have to go to really fine time and length scales to see the graininess of the solvent. You can, people do that, there are experiments. You can do surface forces apparatus where you can measure things at uh, the atomic uh, molecular scale and see the deviations, but you have to go down to the solvent molecule scale and its time scale to see departures from the continuum perspective. Yes? It's size, yeah, that's all. Tau P was the momentum relaxation time. Time scale for the particle is momentum to relax, right? It depends upon the mass. This no longer depends upon mass. There's no mass here any longer, right? <coughs> Jimmy had a question? Yeah, it might be a stupid question. Why do we care about ground motion? I mean, I understand why Einstein cared about it, because he wanted to get information about molecular sizes and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. numbers. Why is it important? Yeah. Because at every living cell in your body, part of the mechanism by which the molecules get transported around inside the each cell is by Brownian motion, by diffusion. So the molecules, the proteins in your cells, which are all the size range, proteins are all 10 nanometers in size, they are undergo, they are subject to Brownian motion. And that, uh, that impacts how they sample space, how they do, how they bind to a receptor in your cells. All those things are governed by this. Okay. Is that a good answer? Yeah, you'd be alive. Wouldn't be alive without it. Well, I understand yeah, that, yeah. but I, I mean, I and in, okay. and so, so, so all biological. Then also manufacturing all kinds of materials. So many many uh, colloidal scale self assembly process. It's the Brownian motion, which is the way the things are sampling space. Okay, I don't know what colloidal self assembly is, but I had a picture the other day, right? No, 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 yeah, but how you make materials out of small particles. Okay. okay. You put them together, and they so find and each other. Motion is acting against self no, it's it's cause it's how that's how the particles sample space. So if I put a particle in a potential well, it, it samples that space by Brownian motion. If I have a, a distribution well, it hops around by Brownian motion. It's how it explores the available space in the statistical mechanical sense. It's the Brownian it's, it's the Brownian motion is the way it wanders around and, and, and explores space. It's how it achieves the Boltzmann equilibrium if it's an equilibrium process. It's by Brownian motion. It's all the way which is doing that, and so that's essential for how everything behaves. Okay, but also I would say. It's Absolutely, absolutely, yes, for sure. It's becoming increasingly important in that regard. And then, as I said, all polymer molecules uh, do this. This is how you understand them. Um, all the treatments of them are based upon this. All the motion, all the, all the chemical binding in their cells are all based upon this because anything that's in the solvent, even if you're worried about a chemical molecule, as Einstein did with a sugar molecule, he applied this to really small things. But if I think about the two proteins binding together, a protein binding that's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, small molecule, they're still in a solvent, typically. They're not out in a vacuum. And so they get together, they have to push the solvent out of the way in order to be able to come into contact. And so the solvent's always fluctuating. So this is actually relevant for how they find each other and how they interact with each other. There are other forces at role. They have electrostatic and other charged things, you know, but they always have the thermal fluctuations from the solvent giving rise to binding motion, which are important for how things explore space and interact. 
Right, but these aren't these aren't these aren't relevant for uh, I mean, these aren't relevant for uh, ex except for the actual you know if, if a chemical reaction takes place between a uh, receptor and its and its molecule, it's by Brownian motion. It's not any molecular ballistic process whatsoever. If you want to study that, then you have to keep the first two lambda. Not for chemical reaction? No, you don't. Yeah. No, the bind? No, no way. No how? The final microscopic in, in a femtosecond connection? Yes. But how this thing finds this thing, it's brown motion. You know the short times doesn't matter at all. Yeah. But motion would be how these things? Yeah. Okay. This guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This oh yeah, no, no. This is this these guys here. Tom this this sets everything. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I guess I guess I I, I uh right. Let me just let me just uh, I had the I had the advantage, unlike you, of 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 remembering what I said yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> 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 ah, that's supposed to be a joke. There we go. Right. So uh, you know, there's this guy, right? These things here. These little po these little polymer molecules are micron size. That's the jigging around. That's the brownian motion that's taking place. Okay, that's what that we see. Okay. Yeah, but you know, let's say in a microscopic process, if these uh, if the large particles are are uh, exerting forces on one another, mm -hmm. then maybe the jiggling is not playing an important role. It depends. Sure, it depends. On the other hand, if the jiggling is responsible for them binding one another, yeah, yeah, true. sure, of course, of course, right. It depends. Uh, there, there, there are uh, there'll be other dimensionless groups which play a role, right? So it would be what Peclet number you're at, and so on and so forth, which are relevant, right? So that's what's important, and that gives rise to that, right? That's where all those numbers came from last yesterday. So one thing to remember is you're a half a micron in size, right? It's twice as dense as the fluid. Its fall speed by balancing the Stokes drag to gravity is a half a micron per second. Diffusivity is a half a micron squared per second. Uh, sorry, Reynolds number is half one times n minus six. Diffusivity is half a micron squared per second. But importantly, the Peclé number, so how much is Brownian motion relative important compared to sedimentation due to gravity, is a half. Okay, so it's Brownian motion that is important. If you make the particle uh, much bigger, then its diffusivity is less and its fall speed is large, and this then becomes a large Peclet number, and then Brownian motion is no longer important. If you make it much smaller, Brownian motion becomes more important. Right? So the half micron is the good number that really defines what a collate is, because it's the size scale in which the motion due to which the effects of Brownian motion are important. Okay. <coughs> okay, so oh, take a breath. That's good. So that's so the summarize is just one assumption that the colloidal particle is large compared to the solvent. Everything else follows from that assumption. You don't need anything additional at all. Make it a continuum and it's got no momentum and it's Brownian. But the fact that if you can consider the solvent to behave as a continuum is really astounding. Ah, yeah, for sure. No. Uh, that's a whole other astounding, uh, you mean generally speaking, not just in this particular no, context. Yeah, yeah right, right. Well, it's that, that, it, that it's at a thousand particles is a, is a lot, of, lot, actually, that's all. And I, it seems to me, I may be mm -hmm. wrong, it's not, so many, it's not so much the number of particles, but the number of interactions. Yes, right. And, and, and so it's the number of particles times, times the time difference that you have. Well, I'm thinking about the number of particle interactions due to the temperature, due to the. Surface. Right. Yes, but then, but, then, but then I have to ask, what did my body do how to respond? And that point here for these guys, since they're slow and sluggish, they get a lot of time to experience lots of collisions. So I get the product of the number plus the separation of time scales, which is a huge factor. Yeah. And so then even a, even a factor of 10 in size is now 10 to the sixth interactions before I know to do something different. Yeah, but in and other systems yeah. where you don't have that large number of interactions, more macroscopic systems, you never to make that kind of an Sure, sure, sure. A composite material. Right, oh, yeah, absolutely, right.
Other questions or comments? How are we doing time-wise here? Okay. Uh, yep, please. Go ahead. Uh, no. So you mentioned something about random materials. So which it basically grains with air maybe. Right. And the air could be thought of as a continuum or ignored completely. So in that case the uh, the, the Brownian motion would not really play a role or what what or would that be the because the particles are going to hit each other. So there would be so that's right. So if you think about the granular guys, uh, big grains, sort of you know millimeter size and air, they're in a fluid, but the air is probably not very important. So they're uh, even even if so, we can one way to think about neglecting the air is it's got no Reynolds number, it's nothing, and they, but they still have particle inertia. They got no Brownian motion either, right? But then I have collisions amongst the grains they're running around, and so now I can ask a different question, which Jim is alluding to. If I now think about a granular gas banging around and go up to treat that as now a continuum, then I have the same thought process going on about the kinetic theory of collisions and so on. Um, we don't have, as Jim alluded, the luxury of having so many particles and so many collisions in the time scale of interest for change. And so that makes it a difficult or difficult problem. Here we have a huge separation of scales. I'll put them in a moment. Yep. I'll put everything in a moment. Okay, don't worry. Okay. Um, and, and you can do that easily here because in Stokes' flow, I can superimpose effects. So my momentum balance um, is, where did my, did my chalk go? My momentum balance is um, <coughs> no acceleration. I had my hydrodynamic forces my Brownian forces, uh, I want to have inner particle forces. Oh, I want to have external forces. Let me just add them up. That'd be gravity, for example. Okay. This, with that, what I mean by that is, is a colloidal force between these two particles, not the solvent force. So they could be charged, for example. Okay. And I have electrostatic interactions which are transmitted directly not via the solvent between these particles. Okay? That would be there. And there are lots of those in colloid science. But at a particle scale, that FB would still then be external. Uh, there it is. It's, that it's external. It's not from the solvent, not from the fluid. Okay. It's these two particles interact directly with each other. It could be a hard sphere collision. It could just be excluded volume. It lives here. Okay? And I can just add them in because the equations are linear and you can superimpose all the effects. So and when you suppose you had hard sphere collision, mm -hmm. particle particle collision, mm -hmm. then there could be a place where the Brownian motion would then not be important so because there will be some other Sure, sure. I mean you could you can you can take these things where you can drive it such that the driving due to external gravity is much more important than Brownian motion or the driving due to you know particle force is much more yeah, you can get those regimes, absolutely. So I do that from a dimensionless numbers perspective and see where you live, right? Okay. Okay. Direct interaction. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be it it, it lives over here for yeah. you guys, right? But inertia of the particle will also be important. Yeah. Put them back in. There we go. Right, and then you can go. You can actually, you can, we've done, you can actually smoothly connect from this to granular flows continuously with no change of any, with continuous variation of a parameter. Okay, um, right. So, hydrodynamics played a role in everything. Um, characterized the drag force, characterized the Brownian forces. And so, um, I'm going to then remind you a few things about hydrodynamics. So, um <coughs> because the linearity of um, uh, part, this is, uh, it, was, it was interesting. It was, it was non-spherical on my screen, but now it's spherical on the board. Okay, all right. So particle size L um, is there's now uh, both translation and rotation. So there's now a coupling tensor which couples uh, force to velocity, force to angular velocity, and so on. They're all coupled together. And this again, geometry only, and that's how it scales with the size, the viscosity, the solvent, the size of the particle. What those scalings are. 
Um, it's also, it's got, it's got certain symmetries, so it's symmetrical on the diagonal and so on and so forth. Um, and one often wants to uh, make things move, and so you want the invert of this. You get what's called the mobility matrix. That gives me, this gives me the force in terms of the velocities. The mobility gives me the velocities in terms of the force, and these are inverses of each other. You can show this is symmetric and positive definite, so it always says an invert. Um, so that's always true. But the individual components are not necessarily inversions of each other because I can have off diagonal couplings. Particularly this coupling here represents a coupling between force and angular velocity. And so for a single body, in order to have that kind of coupling, the body has to be chiral or handed because this is a pseudo vector and that's a real vector. And so that's um, what happens when you have um <coughs> a screw like particle. If you rotate it, it'll cause it, depending on the tangent, it'll cause it to translate. Okay? And that's direct coupling here between translation and rotation. There's an a even, even simpler example of that. Um, you put a particle next to a wall, particle next to a wall, and you rotate it, and it translates. Okay? Right? We all know that. That's from this. This guy here might actually be doing this because it's a thin layer of fluid between these two things and it's slow Reynolds number flow between those two fluids. So this motion actually may be precisely that coupling between translation and rotation. So it's very simple it exists. <coughs> okay, um, <coughs> you can keep going. I can add a flow. As I mentioned last time, add a shear flow. So now far away from the particle, I've got some linear flow, uh, some translation center of the particle plus a linear flow. And I mentioned to you last time, quadratic character of flow, you have to worry about the direct interactions with the walls. And so it's not, it's not relevant to think about that without worrying about the walls. And you just make a bigger matrix. And now another term important to make it nice and symmetrical, again, a new term appears, which is called the stresslet, which is the first moment of the force density. The force, the symmetric first moment. The force is the zeroth moment of the force density of the particle surface. The torque is the weighted moment, weighted the antisymmetric part, and the symmetric part of that force moment is what's called the stresslet in fluid mechanics, and that makes a nice, again, symmetric positive definite uh, matrix for particles. Okay. And all these are just, they're just geometry, and then um, for two particles, uh, it's the infinity of strain rate, and this would be uh, the vorticity of the flow, right? This is the velocity gradient of the fluid, so linear flow. And so that comes, this is a natural way it comes back. So only motion relative to the fluid generates force. Okay? I'm trying to think of, is there an easy way to see how the force affects couples with the strain rate? How, the f how what couples with strain rate? RFE. RFE. For a sphere it's, not e it sphere, it's zero, so it's not easy to think about, okay? But for a non-spherical particle, then there's a chance the particle can actually do this in, in response to the flow. LE would be that way, right. So for a, for a spherical particle, this would do nothing as well. But for a non-spherical particle, it would want to orient along the extensional axis of the flow. And so it would rotate, if it had no torque on it, it would rotate to line up along the extensional axis of the flow. Okay? That would be a torque. That would, that, you, know, you put a particle <coughs> in a shear flow that's you know, like this, it's going to want to rotate, right? Um, for, the for the motion, dynamics is not important to commute, but we'll see it does play a role for the viscosity and the stress. So to move the particles, no. Because to move the particles, I just need to know these guys. Yeah. But I need to know the forces and torques. And then I have to, my balance law to tell me what are the other forces and torques which are operative, right? So this F here is all these guys now. And, and okay. what is capital U zero? Is that the fluid motion and the absence of particles? Uh, this, th this case is a single particle, so it's far away, yes. So in this case, it would be the fluid motion far away. You have a uniform flow, flow far away, for example. So I have a particle, a uniform flow far away, and if I put a particle in it and no force on it, it'll translate with that flow. It'll just drift along with no force on it. Okay? So uh, to, to make it move relative to that fluid, I have to exert a force to hold it fixed, for example. Okay? Okay, 
This is a single particle at an infinite unbounded mass. Well, I'll make a suspension in, in okay. due course. Okay, that's an important thing to worry about. But yes, mm -hmm. I'm still at one particle and an unbounded fluid. Okay, <laughs> okay. But the point is, there's this symbol R which comes. I haven't told you how to compute it at all yet. Um, it doesn't. That's a very important thing, but it doesn't matter. It's, uh, just ha all you have to know is it exists, right? That's all you need to know it exists. Um, if that's one particle, I can make two. Yes, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. uh, symmetric and positive, definite, yes. Correct. Right, these are rigid particles. Um, to a certain extent, you can extend it. If I make a small deformation, I could extend it. Or well, another way to, uh, you can, you do aspects like this, which you can do for deformable objects as well. It's a little more complicated. I'll show you a, an example if we get to of uh, swimming organisms where they deform, which you can use this to do. Well, if you, if you, for a given geometry of a particle, you can always define this thing, okay? Problem with a deformable particle is its geometry is changing as a function of time, but there's no time in Stokes' equation, so at each instant I have a snapshot of geometry, there is a resistance matrix which has all these properties at that instant in time. So change the function of time. That's a, you know, I have to track that change, but at every instant in time I can define this even for a deformable particle. Okay. <coughs> Any more questions? Before we go to two, we gotta get to two. Okay, two. There's two. All right. Now two. I have to worry about the force on one due to the motion of one. The force on one due to the motion of two, and so on. And so you just keep making it messy, and they're and they're known. For spheres, we know everything there is to know about them for all separation distances, for all size ratios. You can look up in a book all the possible symbols that I had before, all these tensors, and so on, and figure out what they are. Um, and what's important? That's uh, what's important. So what's important is the following. So um, let me go back a second here. So you can define motion along the line of centers this way, and motion transverse the line of centers. That's what you have for spherical particles. Uh, that's the simplest thing. So two different contributions. So you're going to look at that contribution along the line of centers. Um, and <coughs> what you see, if I take two particles um, and push them, so this is what it looks like, I'm plotting one particular value for motion along the line of centers as a function of the non-dimensional separation between two identical particles. What's important are two things to note, is when the particles are far apart, the interaction is very long range, be like one over r. That's true both for motion along the line of centers as well as motion transverse to the line of centers. When particles come close together, the forces diverge strongly, as I push two particles towards each other, as I've indicated here, the force diverges like one over the gap space between the particle surfaces because I have to squeeze out the viscous fluid between these two particles, a large pressure gradient to push them out. That pressure resists the motion that gives rise to a diverging force like one over the gap spacing. Okay? For the tangential motion, it's easy, relatively easy to slide tangentially. And so for these smooth particles, it's just logarithmically singular. It's not one over gap singular. Okay? So that's the essential elements that are involved in hydrodynamics. Um, people have measured these. People measured for two particles by um, John Greer, uh, John Crocker, uh, by light scanning, fixing optical tweezers, can measure for two particles. Um, both um, we measure both the center of mass motion as well as the relative motion, and I measure both motion if you will, this way, as well as uh, this way, as well as that, all possible combinations. And these shows you comparison experimentally between the measurements and the um, uh, predictions from the hydrodynamic interactions amongst two particles. These are measurements of the mobility. It's the inverse, so they're not singular at contact. They just go to some finite value. As a matter of fact, the relative velocity goes to zero if particles come close together because there's not an infinite force pushing them. Okay. So that's been measured experimentally. Um, that's just two particles, so it should agree precisely with what the theory says, so it does. <coughs> um, we did some experiments with, as I showed you last time, of raft of particles adjacent to a solid boundary. 
We're working out the various modes of motion, you know, center of mass motion, relative motion, and so on. You can work out all the possible combinations for various separations of this little uh, cluster for various heights above the bottom wall. And this shows the comparison between the measurements for those modes with the uh, predictions from the hydrodynamic interactions. And so it agrees quite well, even adjacent to a boundary for many particles as well. Right. <coughs> the last thing I need to mention is I told you last time about lubrication. Um, because of the fact that uh, particles, it takes a lot of force to separate or push them together. If I push them, they all move as a line. If I pull them, they all move as a line as, as well. They'd rather translate into solid, like a solid object than to separate. And you should appreciate the fact that when I pull this particle here, it's not communicating through the fluid here to cause them to move. They're all stuck together. It's communicated by the short contacts, the lubrication contact between the particles which cause it's not the long-range hydrodynamic interactions. As a matter of fact, if you have lots of nearby particles, you can throw away all the long-range interactions. This is all dominated by the near-field interactions. Okay. <coughs> right. Okay. Uh, but the near-field is still inside FH. Say again, please. The near-field interaction is still inside FH. It's all FH. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It's all, it's all from the hydrodynamics. Right. You could add other forces, but this is just what the hydrodynamics alone will do that. Other forces can be very important in college. There are lots of other forces, but that's high dynamics are, are sufficient to give you those. They, they're sufficient to give you. They're sufficient to give you the fact that it looks like a rigid rod. As a matter of fact, if you push in this thing here, and even though you push only one particle or pull only one particle, the motion is identical to a rigid rod, because it would rather just translate as a rod than pull apart. Is yes. No limitation at all. It eventually it'll separate. The drag keeps going up and growing up and growing up. Eventually then that drag, the whole object gets to be comparable to the drag I would have to separate from the particle. And so eventually then it would start to separate. You can work that out. It's epsilon compared to the length is what it's going to be, right? Are these are connected or like they're no, just, to, just next to each other. Fluid. Just the fluid gap. No, they would rather translate together as if they were a rigid object than separate. But uh, the forces between both forces acting on the particles which are at the center may be different from the forces acting on the extreme. The, the, in this particular example, there's no force acting on all these particles, only an external force in that particle. Are they, all the rest of the particles have no force on them at all. None. No force. See? There's no brain <laughs> no motion. No, the, the only one part of the rest are zero force on those guys. There's no force on them. I'd be interested in the resistance to bending. Ah, uh, bending, yeah, sure. That's a that's a more interesting question. And particularly if you push, right? Because then it's gonna buckle at some stage. And it's easy to move sideways. Well it's easy to move sideways, but still, let's say bending mm -hmm. this kind is resistant by lubrication. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but but by easy easy in the sense easier. that Easier in that sense, yes. And so actually, um, if people have done measurements of bending colloids, and some people have done all those kind of things, uh, you, keep, you use optical tweezers to manipulate those kind of things. But when I'm referring to the fact that if I have pushed this chain of particles, I can relatively pop out sideways because it's only a logarithmic singularity, and so I can pop out, and so that's what will happen. Okay, and that actually happens. The force change and shear flow. That's what happens. Right, um, and you just. You get tired of writing the symbols down, so you just write it as one symbol at the end of the day. Okay, so, so you just hide a lot of sins by collapsing all those things into just the symbol. All n particles in any kind of geometry you want, it's just the same way. Okay, yeah, that's good. Right, okay, yeah, one last important thing. Okay, one last important thing I want to say. Um, going back to this picture for the interaction of two particles, and what I want to emphasize the fact is that now I have many particles, but still, the near field is the identically the same. I cannot get a third particle between these two when the gap is much smaller than the radius. And so the hydrodynamic interactions, even in the full many body system, are the same when particles are close together. Long range is still long range. There's no screening taking place in these interactions. They're still long ranged. The amplitudes get affected by multiple scanning, but the interactions don't. <coughs> so, I'm sorry, I didn't mm -hmm. so you, you 
say there's still a long range. Mm -hmm. Even if a many particle, if I push this guy here, and the far away, it still transmits one over r. It'll transmit if you in, through an effective viscosity, not the solvent viscosity in essence, but it still decays like one over r far away. Okay, so unlike the electrostatics. The motion of that particle is still seen as the distance, but perhaps through through an infinitely effective medium. Through its neighbors. Yes. Yeah. But but as opposed to electrostatics, where it gets screened by the other particles and changes its decay character. Here it does not. Okay. And did you say then the viscosity that, that would be relevant to that is, would be the effective viscosity? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I understand. Right. Yeah. And so if I'm very dense, it could be much bigger than the solvent viscosity, and so it could look like it decayed away, but technically it doesn't decay away. It's still a 1 over right. R decay. Right. Okay. Tends not to be that critical, but that's an, for those that know, it's not screened, what the screening means. Okay. <coughs> Um, I think this is where I want to say, yeah. And I want to, uh, okay, so I haven't told you how we do any of this stuff. And so at this point, I want to tell you um, the. Oh, yes, please. Uh, when you were doing a single particle uh, example, mm -hmm. and you had, uh, you, you extended the, the resistance matrix to include the stress weight and So if you were to do the same thing over here, is it done? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. In which case, coming back to the question here, the I have I haven't made a suspension yet. I'm still I'm still a finite number of particles. Okay, I'm still there. Okay, I'll, I'll do that for you. Okay, okay. Just be keep, don't 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 forget to ask when I get to that point. Okay, okay. Um, I wanted to say one thing about um, the, the 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 idea of of how we do these interactions, and I wanted this picture here uh, for that to explain the idea behind what we call statics and dynamics and. <coughs> And the idea is the following one. So let's imagine just three particles is enough. One, two, three. You know, you really, you really would like to know how they move. So you really would like to know the mobility, not the resistance. I thought the resistance is the more fundamental because it's forces, but you really want to know how things move. Yeah, so I have to invert it at some stage. And so, but the important point is that if I think of these two particles alone and I want their relative velocities and whatever force they act on, the relative velocity is going to be small because they're close together, okay? So let me just say then uh, V12 relative will go like epsilon, where epsilon is sort of the gap space in there, right? So that's two particles, so it happens. If I put a third particle down there and try to add in its influence, you see its distance from this particle and this particle are going to be different, and it's going to push them and make them now, the relative velocity, not be small. It's going to be dominated by the effect of the third particle which is completely wrong. I'm taking that number there, which should have been small, and I'm adding to it uh, some constant from the third particle, and the constant is going to win and dominate the effect and give you completely wrong behavior. So this is in the mobility. And in the resistance, <coughs> we get same situation, but now the resistance, I'm asking the force and the relative force between 1 and 2, that's now 1 over epsilon. And now I add something from the third particle, and I add a number, and the 1 over epsilon wins. So when I now go back to find the velocity, it goes to 0 properly. So that's the whole idea that you can get away with approximations in this perspective and still capture both the long range and the near range physics where you cannot from this perspective. That's the whole idea. It's just that. And that's how it works. So what is conceptually <laughs> wrong because of the pairwise? Uh, pairwise additivity, right. So I do these, see, you know, do this one, they do this, and I do this and this one, this one, add them together, and these things then this effect dominates. Not, not only is it inaccurate, it dominates, which is wrong <laughs> physically, right? There's inaccuracies because you're never going to do everything exactly correct anyway, right? But here at least you made sure that you capture the dominant physics so that you know that these two guys cannot run over each other, no matter what happens outside. And that you capture because you're adding a, a number compared to a large number. And, it and you, when you then find the subsequent motion at the end of the day, 
the large number wins. So for this case, if has somebody done a, not a stochastic that, but full blown simulation for just for a three particle without any assumptions to verify that if you it actually goes like this? Um, yeah, yes, you can. Well, we did that early on. Um, to to pair with that enemy, yeah, I did that stuff and it works terribly. So, but but. Have, there are there are simple geometries of three to met three configurations, but not with relative motion. So I don't think anybody's really done that carefully. We've done the so, um, but but you have in the Stokes dynamics formulation people you can you can include more interactions and systematically. Uh, and Tony Ladd has done that systematically show how you converge as, as if I did an infinite number of interactions. So that's what's been done. Yes, please. Yes. And once we get the oral resistance matrix and invert it to the three mobility matrix, from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I, the resistance is, it might say also more fun, but that's where the forces come from. And the forces you add together. And the forces you can always superimpose. But I can't superimpose the velocities. And that's the difference. So make your assumptions on the resistance matrix. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you see, I, you, you pay a price because you have to invert the solve for the velocities. But that inversion process makes the all particles drag together as a rigid rod. Because it's, it, there's, a, there's a strong connectivity associated with the lubrication, which makes the inversion process all become a rigid object. So it's all connected in the geometry that's inside the resistance matrix. And you have to pay a price, unfortunately, for that because you've got to solve the system of equations, right? But you're capturing all the right uh, physics associated with that. Well, particles, two particles are very close together. If there's a finite force pushing them, then the velocity goes to zero in context. The velocity goes to zero proportional to the separation distance. So if I do these two particles alone, the velocity goes to zero. Now I start adding the effects of the third particles. I add some number compared to zero, and the number of other numbers are going to win. So they're going to be completely dominated by the, all the other neighbors around me, as opposed to this perspective where they're not. And that makes all the difference in the world. This intuition is very you know, appealing. Mm -hmm. How about the long range thing? It, is this uh, done only for the short range lubrication or even for the other long range hydrodynamic? Uh, only for the short range. The long range, you got to do all the many body. Oh, this is only for short range. Yeah, but it, it, that's the important feature to do it in that way. Okay. Um, yeah, so you look at this thing here and um, you make a decision um, in some sense of where you think it's going to be starting to take off. And so in a practical sense, the short range uh, don't uh, appear until you're about one-tenth of the radii separation. Then you're into this diverging piece. And then you rely upon all the rest. They're all many-body interactions. You make it continuous so you don't have any, you do it in a, in a proper, clever kind of way so that you have a continuous function because later on we, can take, we need to take derivatives of this function so you don't want to do any, any you don't want any cutoff kind of things. You want to do it in a continuous smooth fashion, but you do it in a, in a proper way that you, uh, and you do it in a proper way there in, in proper formulation such that um, you recover the exact result for two particles which you know, okay? So you don't mess that part up. And then you have a way to do the many body reactions, which I uh, will tell you about in a second. We still have time? Or no? Yeah, we still have time. I started late, right? Okay. Good. I just want to um, then, I'm going to show you. Um, this, is, this is sort of a breather, since we're, this is heavy going, you know. So, so remember these fun particles? This is fun. You're supposed to now wake up and laugh at the fun things we saw spinning around yesterday. So that was these guys and the tetrahedron and the cube and just dancing balls, you know, just to sort of get us all. Happy again after all those heavy equations and discussions. So dancing balls and two particles which uh, run around each other and kiss and tumble and stay in bound pairs, even though you might think they get out. And then my favorite of this crazy thing that does this sort of like uh, you know wild dance. Right? So okay. So before I go to my suspension, which I'm going to get to, I promise you, um, I want to do this. I want to do self-propelled autonomous swimming things. 
I want to do a paramecium. We have a little hair on the surface. I want to do a volvox, which is an allergy colony, a little hair sticking out like that. Or these are what are called catalytic nanomotors. These move by chemical reaction on the surface with a little, and they all, all these bond problems can be modeled with a little tiny slip layer of fluid on the surface. These are more or less rigid body shapes. But these have little hairs which cause the fluid to move. These have little hairs you can't see, little cilia that you can't see out there, unfortunately. All those create a little fluid motion on the surface of more or less a rigid body, as do these, which are chemical swimmers that undergo a chemical reaction, which is a, uh, results in diffuser phoresis to cause these guys to move. All those have a thin layer of fluid moving at the surface. And it turns out um, what I just told you um, is exactly the same. All you do, all you do, is now have a contribution from the slip velocity at the surface, just like we had the imposed flow from infinity. This matrix is identical. And you can make complicated things whose change as a function of time. These bodies are changing their shape as a function of time, all composed of little elements who all are described by this matrix. So you can do all the micro swimmers that people do can be done in exactly the same fashion. But how do I don't understand how capital U, capital Omega and E model what's happening on the surface of the of the object. That's a that's a separate uh, discussion. You have to go into the mechanics of how these are actually doing stuff for what, okay. for the for the fluid mechanical guys, is a squirmer. It's called a squirmer. They actually do so on the phoretic particles. You can work out what's the slip velocity in terms of the chemical gradients and so on. So you have to do work to get those things, but so those are separate things that are important to know. But then the mechanics of then how the body moves in response to those forces can be written down in the same fashion, with the same geometric thing. Okay? So for those who have codes, you just go and put these in out outcome swimmers. And here we're integrating those surface velocities over the surface. There are moments of the force density in the surface, there are moments of the velocity field across to the it depends upon in the case of squirmers, what's called the squirming set, the actual details of how cilia moving at the surface generate a local flow of the surface and there's different characteristics of that. You can generate different types of swimmers. And all those can be represented by a different squirming set, which have different properties of translation, rotation, straining, other higher moments as well. So you have to get a bigger matrix to do all it properly. But you can just do all that stuff. The point is that, the, that, that as far as the mechanics of motion of the fluid are concerned, you can just write the fluid Stokes flow with some disturbance velocity in the surface of the particle. Where that comes from is a different question. But once I'm given that, then all the rest follows. Okay. This is a very nice question. Yeah. Instead of thinking of the flow being imposed from the past field, you are saying that the particle generated the flow. That's all the question. U minus U infinity. Absolutely. Now it's projected back to the surface of the particle. That's how you do it for an imposed flow. I could have some other surface velocity from someplace else. Electrophoretic. Yes. There's some there there's other physics into whether that's a good estimate or good approximation, of course. But once you've done that, you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah, so this is an amoeboid, right. And that's made of rigid elements. Correct. Yeah. Right. And you can do it, um, and, and, and th there's a paper there, and the, actually the code's provided. You can download the code to do all this stuff. Um, these are funny, crazy things. This is a, a head with a tail. The tail, the tail is, in this case, the tail is a, a helix. In this case, the kinematics are specified. The head rotates the opposite direction because there's no net torque on the whole body, and then it translates. Okay, but the drag is from the body head. This thing has got some kinematically specified the deformation characteristics of this thing. Alternatively, you can specify um, you can specify you can put particles where you now connect them together by spring-like forces and activate those forces to generate the deformation, which then generates the motion. You can do that as well. Okay, so you can build up. We did this in hopes people would take the code and use it so they could compare swimmers with each other rather than, but I don't think anybody's ever downloaded it. So, anyway, go ahead. Uh, the surfaces represented by a set of spherical objects. 
because I'm because I'm lazy. I don't know. It's a hard problem in general, right? So this is just cheap and dirty because you already you already paid work to write this thing. So it's just you know it took it was a weekend of work literally. Literally a weekend to take what we had done to do these. That's all it took because the code existed. You just figured out how to do it and you're done. And so we did it. So I wrote a paper in a weekend. I'm not joking. Okay. And so you can do all kinds of crazy funny things, right? Okay. Can you also use this scheme to, to deal with propulsion? So I, I, I see deformation, but tr can you get translational motion out of it? Absolutely. The appropriate Absolutely. deformation? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Right. And are there creatures, I mean, mm -hmm. are there creatures that propel themselves purely by deformation and not this... Uh, Okay, so there are the ciliated ones, which are basically big, they can help pro themselves. They're so these are all kind of cilia. Well, there's there are four categories of micro swimmers. There's ciliates, flagellates, amoeboids, which change the body shape, uh -huh. and spirochetes, which have an internal screw. Those are that made what the biologists tell me. Those are four, and this can, you can do all those different types of things. And there are some that do both or all of them together. Okay, uh, I'm not saying this is the best way to do them or so on and so forth. I'm just telling you that you can you can understand in the mechanics of those things from this perspective. And if you're cheap like me, doesn't want to write a code a second time, you just take your same code and and now since you can do lots of spheres, you know this is, this was done years ago. We couldn't do that many. Um, you can make really complicated objects. Okay, you can afford to do those kind of things now. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> this is a crazy thing. Um, it's <laughs> it's just uh, a bunch of particles together, which um, um, the one half of them is are individually spinning, so the whole thing spins. If you make them all spin, um, then it'll translate. It imaginates fluid this way and translate this way. It was just one of the examples we did um, in that paper we wrote. It w I, the paper was written because it was a class, and uh, the, the c author of the paper is the class. And everybody in the class did a different micro swim as part of their projects. And we all wrote a paper together as part of the class. And this was just a funny one we did. We d people did different types of swimmers and different dumbbells and all kinds of different kind of things just for fun. And had this was just a fun thing. Just a fun thing. What happened if the uh, <laughs> other half rotates? If you, if, you, well, if you work the opposite way, it'll stay put. You can, um, we made some of these things. I'll dig up my other videos. I have, there are so many videos. And we have this guy chase somebody else to eat him and so you can just have fun. I mean it's just fun. It's, you know, and, and then you can make ones which do just all rotate in the same sense. So these particles then we all individually rotating and the net thing will then translate. This guy just spins, it doesn't translate. If I rotate them all in the same sense, it will draw fluid in this way between its hole and then it'll move that way, right? Like a smoke ring. Yeah. Okay. That's a low runnels number smoke ring. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. These ones, the kinematics were specified, yes. But you could also uh, do it differently where you have other ways you can specify some other aspects of the dynamics and the kinematics come out from that. So you can do them differently depending on what you think you might know. So the lower motion is the same way this was uh, the uh, resistance matrix, whereas the individual motion is different. It's just uh, you, connect this, you connect all these particles together to make a single object. Now there's, an, 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 now there's a matrix which collapses all the individual matrices down to one matrix for the overall body. And then that's force free, force and torque free. Mm -hmm. So they're all force and torque free, these guys. They're all self propelled. <coughs> okay. So you download the paper and download the code and have fun. Um, a suspension, finally. Okay. I didn't want okay, so one last thing you need to do. Okay, <coughs> so you want to do an infinite system in periodic boundary conditions. So there we go. So now we replicated periodic. So the first thing you got to do is ask yourself: Is everything still okay? Right. And so it turns out then you have now uh, your fundamental starting point is the periodic Stokes solution to the problem. And there is a periodic Stokes solution. You can show that mathematically that exists. And then you can show that there is a, there's a velocity of each particle, and that's periodic. This guy has the same velocity as this one, and so on. 
And then when you do that, then you want to ask if I want to particularly shear it, for example, what is the rate of strain that takes place? When you do that, then um, first back up, what the velocity then, there's the overall velocity, the overall velocity. So every, every what comes out then is all right this way. So when you do that, <coughs> so an individual particle velocity comes out relative to an average velocity. Um, right, that's the relevant kind of thing um, that you get. And that average is the average over all the material in the unit cell, both the fluid and the solid. That's how it formulates itself. Okay. So this. You could do it that way if you wanted to, but then you can write that as the integral. This is the volume integral over all the material in the cell, right? That's what comes out. So it's not. So if if, if you think about a suspension perspective, this would be the volume fraction times the velocities of the particles plus. 1 minus the volume fraction times the velocity of the fluid. If you think of the usual way, think of multi-phase flow kind of averaging. So what's important is the average velocity of the stuff. And it's the motion relative to that, which is how it naturally formulates itself. And similarly, if you put a shear flow, what naturally comes out then is the average rate of strain of the material. Not the rate of strain of the fluid, nor the rate of strain of the particles, but the rate of strain of the stuff mixture. of the mixture. That's how it naturally formulates itself when you go through to make it in this periodic system. And you can show that there is a symbol E, which is a constant tensor and so on and so forth, all those things because you know lots of properties of Stokes flow. So you can actually rigorously do all that stuff uh, mathematically in this context. So you don't ever actually have need walls. You can prove that this is possible to exist to have a, such a thing as a bulk shearing motion in the material. But it's the rate of strain of the entire stuff. The mixture. So this is uh, to the <coughs> friction, the boundary friction, even though it should be the relative velocity between the solid and the fluid, ultimately comes out in terms of U alpha minus average. Um, so uh, and I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean by that question, but this is the rigid translational velocity of the particle, and it's relative to the suspension average velocity. Only that, then I have forces associated with that. Right, because, uh, because, yes, uh, because <coughs> you got a particle here, and what you write then is you typically you start off writing the Stokes flow, I subtract off the flow at infinity, right? And then I work from that and derive my force for associated with that. Right, okay, yep, okay. So you do the analogous thing in the suspension, and what you comes out looking like this. Okay. Oh, there's lots of integrals over infinity and convergence <laughs> and so on and so forth. And but yeah. previously yeah. you said, well, you could do the same thing by integrating over the surface. I mean, in the previous example. Well, in the previous example, I did. So um, I didn't talk about it this way. But so if you. But I, what I'm going to suggest yep. is that there are different resistant ma matrices depending upon which velocity you choose to employ? Um, you could do it that way. You can do, there's many ways to do it. There are many ways to define things, for sure, well, and so on. Didn't you just provide two examples, one where you're averaging over the mixture, and the other where you're integrating? No, no. That was, okay. that was our single particles. No, that was not that, was not that case. Um, <coughs> so just go back to single particles. So uh, um, I have single particles. So I know that the fluid velocity is equal to u on the surface. And the fluid velocity equals the particle velocity at each point on the surface. And I've got it in some flow at infinity. There we go. All right. Okay. And so way the simplest way to do the problem is to subtract off the flow at infinity. And so write the problem down in terms of that as my velocity that's now on the surface of the particle. And there's no flow at infinity. Okay. Start from that point of view. Right. And then derive these resistance matrices. And 
now you don't worry about this. You, when you do all the stuff, you integrate the services at infinity go away because nothing's happening out there. Okay. You really need to do that first. Okay. So once you've done that, and then you say, okay, that was a single particle. And now if I think about, uh, and then I then I said, well, that what what type of flows of infinity are relevant? And those were the linear flows because if I have the quadratic flow, I should have worried about the direct interaction with the wall that was responsible for the quadratic flow before I even worry about the quadratic character of the flow. So I don't need to worry about those. And so I can have a nice unbounded domain. Okay. Once you did that, and then now you go back to thinking of these squirmer particles, and you say, oh, gee, that's just some of the velocity on the surface. So that's the squirmer. It's just, that's, why not? It's the same thing as the flow at infinity. Okay. I might need the quadratic ones. I actually not important because there's no flow at infinity, but it's the same idea. Now, when you go to the suspension, then you've got to start off with a big box of stuff and worry about the surface integrals at infinity and add up all those contributions correctly. And then you get to project down to something which then comes out looking like that that you had before. And when you do that, then you have to integrate over surface at infinity, which is cut through the suspension, and that forms the suspension averages of everything. And those then you project back down to the surface of the particle as if it were a flow at infinity. And those then naturally appear as the average sus suspension velocity, the average rate of strain. That's how it's done. Okay? There's a lot of work <laughs> in that. But also you can define it, you, could, you, you, do it, you can do it differently. You can say I'm doing periodic conditions. I could define the periodicity functions and so on and, and work from that perspective. And they two are the same thing, of course. And, but I, then, then I don't have these surface integrals at infinity. I can define things in a periodic fashion. So it's as if you're dealing with a single mm -hmm. particle, but it's in the yeah. effective medium. Far away, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And that's why Einstein got it wrong the first time. He used the, when he did his uh, viscosity calculation. He got the wrong answer because he made it in the fluid as he compared the dissipation as opposed to in the effective medium. It went from two to two and a half. Right. Okay. Right. One last thing. So that's it. And so then how do you do this? Uh, yeah, please. Go ahead. Hmm? No, it's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, and 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 you do that. You have to use the, have to periodically sum. And so you have to do Ewald sums and so on and so forth, through all that kind of stuff. You can't, and there's a long range, so you can't get around this thing. There's no way out. If you, if you try to ignore them. Uh, you get these kind of things here. This is what happens if you don't. You, you get completely not just in, not just inaccurate, uh, physically uh, unrealistic uh, kinds of behavior. So that's a bad thing to do. And how it works is just splitting. You the near field you can do for order n. That's easy to do. So that's lubrication. Um, far field is the hard part, and there are lots of different methods to try to do that. Um, that are all um, now you can do them order n log n. Um, so, or order n. There are a variety of techniques, and then there are even even faster ones now, making use of GPUs. Uh, but basically, at the end of the day, you're doing something like you're doing the mass asymptotic expansions for thousands of particles for millions of time steps through the simulations, um, and then you can do big systems. Okay, <coughs> you can do big systems. Um, that's probably enough for today. I, I, there's one more important thing we got to do, but I'll pick it up next time. It fits finds a good transition point. So I've told you about all the important hydrodynamics. I told you where the equations came from, and hopefully you you bought that story. So you want to believe me? You know, you don't have to. Okay, um, and um, try to make as few assumptions as possible and get the basic structure of the equations. And I haven't told you the detail how to do the calculations. I'm happy to discuss that with anybody. Um, there. It looks simple when you test the symbol R. It looks really simple. You know, you start unraveling it and it's got all the stuff concocted in there, particles and rotations. It's a mess inside there, but it looks simple in the symbol R. Um, but the other thing we need to talk about is um, how do you compute properties now, like the average fall speed, average diffusivity, what are those things? And so I'm going to spend some time uh, next time talking about how to compute those things and where the viscosity comes from. And then some other aspects about um, macroscopic modeling uh, where you don't do simulations of those things. Okay, thanks. <laughs>